there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The human body is an extraordinary piece of engineering, honed over millions of years of evolution. With our upright stance and our large brains, we evolved to become the primate that rules the planet. It took a scientific revolution to understand who and what we are to uncover clues hidden deep in our DNA, which explain how we got here, and crack our genetic code to see where we are going. This is a story of epic proportions, and it tells the tale of the evolution of us. Africa is where the human story begins. Today, the vast grasslands of the south are home to the Khoisan people. These Khoisan hunters may seem like supreme athletes, but most of their genes are shared by all of us. The human body is a magnificent machine, tuned over millions of years. The genes inside each of us date back to our most ancient ancestors, the first humans to walk the earth. we have this incredible adaptation for walking on two legs and that seems to be quite fundamental. And that seems to have evolved quite early in human evolution, certainly more than four million years ago. Walking upright is a defining human characteristic. If scientists can understand how and why this happened, then they will have solved a big part of the evolutionary story. Upright walking led to a series of other genetic changes affecting our bodies and our behavior. But how did it enable us to become the primate that rules the planet? At Kyoto University in Japan, Professor Aishi Hirosaki wants to know how walking on two legs might have affected the bodies of the earliest humans. He studies what happens when macaque monkeys stand on two legs and walk. I wanted to know how human beings change their way of moving to walking upright. To study this, I needed an animal that normally walks on four legs, but is capable of walking upright. So I decided to use a macaque monkey. Because the macaque monkey usually walks on all fours, his attempts to stand upright are among the closest the scientists can get to the actions of our ancient ancestors, the first bipedal apes. The researchers use a pressurized mat to monitor the points where the monkey's foot hits the floor. The results show how the pressure changes from four-legged to bipedal walking 
and highlights what else was needed for the earliest humans to walk on two legs. The most important role of the hip muscles shifted to stabilizing the upper body. Chimps and other apes don't need to do that because they use four legs. But for humans to walk on two legs, it's essential to have muscles that stabilize the upper body. Great mobility was something that would give our ancestors a giant leap forward. Throughout its history, our planet has been in constant flux. All species are forced to evolve by the never-ending changes in the world around them. Once they could walk on two legs, our ancestors continued to adapt quickly to changing environments. Starting around 2.8 million years ago, Africa became a lot cooler and more dry. And that created an expansion of grassland habitats. Uh, so lots of animals that eat uh, grass, the herbivores, evolved at that time. So there was selection for running two million years ago in order to become hunters. Daniel Lieberman is professor of human evolutionary biology at Harvard University. He studies what needed to change to enable our ancestors to run. If you ever look at the gluteus maximus of chimpanzees, for example, they're pretty small. But in humans, it's the largest muscle in the body. It's, it's big. And we've done an experiment a few years ago where we showed that when you run, your trunk wants to pitch forward. But the gluteus maximus fires and pulls you back, keeps you from falling over. Evidence in the fossil record reveals just how good our ancestors became at running. This is a part of the skeleton of uh, Homo erectus, who lived around one and a half million years ago. Uh, and what's intriguing is that many of the features of the skeleton tell us he was a runner. For example, his pelvis has a very large area for the insertion of the gluteus maximus. We can look at the anatomy of his inner ear, which tells us he had a head that was really very well designed for, for sensing pitching forces. So he was able to keep his head very still when he ran. He had uh, very large joints the size of his body, much larger than you need if you're walking. These changes to the skeleton took place over thousands and thousands of years. They led to the remarkable modern human body we know today. The truth is, we are all built for running and to have the endurance to cover the long distances that are needed to hunt. <laughs> We walk and walk to find signs of animals. The way we hunt is to just keep chasing them. When the animal gets tired, we shoot an arrow made of bones, and then we catch them. Walking upright and jogging and running, you can cover long distances very efficiently, so the prey will tire out, the prey will overheat, and it will actually slow down and eventually drop down with exhaustion. So this requires incredible marathon running ability to do that over long distances under quite hot conditions. And yet, modern hunter-gatherers can do it in Africa, and our ancestors were doing it probably one and a half million years ago. When you can walk upright, it's a great advantage. Your arms are free to carry things, to carry children. And tool making and tool using is fundamental to humans, and that may have driven the growth of the brain. Also, of course, once humans had the ability to make fire at will, this is very useful for cooking. And also, it's a social focus. Yeah. 
All of these extraordinary changes came about thanks to tiny differences in our genes. But it wasn't until the dawn of the 21st century that we could truly explain the genetics of evolution. The idea of evolution started in the 19th century, when Charles Darwin suggested that species adapt and change. He came up with the theory of natural selection, survival of the fittest, to explain it. Darwin observed that some members of a species survive long enough to have offspring, whilst others do not. This difference is down to slight variations between individuals, giving some of them advantages that increase their chances of survival and reproduction. When we look at the domesticated species that we've been breeding, our breeders are looking for these changes that, that happen to be good and are encouraging those. Natural selection has done the same thing in our ancestry. It, it's encouraging those things that happen to allow people to survive better. Darwin's scientific theory was based on a lifetime of fact-finding and observations. But he didn't understand the mechanics of how these changes take place. It would be another hundred years before we found out. And it took another scientific revolution to get there, the game-changing discovery of DNA. Once we knew the structure of DNA and how it was passed on, people could actually look directly at the mechanism by which evolution was happening. The DNA molecule contains our genetic code. Its double helix structure holds all the information that makes living things grow and develop. Short sequences within our DNA determine particular characteristics, such as height, muscle strength, hair color, and fertility. These are our genes, and variations between them are the basis of evolution. Selection works on individuals, and some individuals will have more children than other individuals, and so their DNA is passed on uh, to future generations. What natural selection cares about, what, it, what it's favoring, is our genes that make you more likely to pass on you, the, your genes to the next generation. Differences in the genetic makeup of our ancestors that helped them to survive were often favored by natural selection. And the process of sexual reproduction makes sure our genes are constantly being mixed up in billions of different combinations. When a child is conceived, half its DNA comes from the mother and half from the father. But there's another critical process for changing our DNA. Tiny variations occur as our cells divide. They're known as mutations. Everyone living today is a mutant. Every new conception that creates a new person has 35 to 50, sometimes even more than 100 mutations that are new in the genome. And everybody carries these new things most of them make no difference to you. But when they do make a difference, they can make a really profound difference. Mutation is critical to evolution. Occasionally, a mutation changes the biology in a way that's good, or at least that increases survival or increases reproduction. And those things are what are positively selected. Natural selection sees those things and causes them to grow in the population. Scientists continue to find many links between genetic mutation and evolution. The discovery of DNA was revolutionary. And at the turn of the 21st century, our genetic understanding surged forward again. In 2003, the Human Genome Project announced it had identified the whole of our genetic code, the blueprint of the human body. 
Our genomes were adapted for the last six million years to become the, the humans that we are today. The ability to compare the genetic material of different people revolutionized our understanding of evolution yet again. Mapping the human genome means we can identify the differences between the genetic makeup of people around the world. What's different between populations in different parts of the world is largely due to the genetic changes that have happened in the last 40,000 years. And crucially for our understanding of how we came to evolve, present-day DNA can be compared with that of the past. In addition to looking at living people and their variability, we now can look into the past by getting DNA from skeletons. And we can test directly. It's just enabled us to tap in on these vast sources of information about our health, about our ancestry, and that enables us to get a much, much more nuanced picture of our evolution. Human DNA, both past and present, shows how our ancient ancestors spread out across the globe and helps reveal how a changing world forced them to adapt and change. Scientists are now comparing our human genome with that of our closest primate relatives, chimpanzees, in search of vital differences. Those parts of the code that have changed the most since the chimp-human split are the ones that shaped humankind. One part of the genome that differs significantly relates to our skin. At Pennsylvania State University, Nina Jablonski studies the evolution of human skin. In order to understand all of the human body, we must understand the evolution of the largest organ, which is the skin. Human skin is different from other primates in that it is mostly naked, and also human skin is very sweaty. The evolution of the genes that relate to the sweat glands in skin was essential to making us superior hunters. We're actually able to run at speeds for really long distances that make other animals have to gallop. Right? And when we run at those distances, at those speeds, we keep cool by sweating. We, we extrude water all over our bodies, and that water evaporates and that cools us. And so we can run long, long distances in the heat. Not all mammals are as good at keeping cool as we are. But well, if you make a, a, a four-legged animal gallop, because those animals can't cool by sweating, they cool by panting. <laughs> they have these short little shallow breaths, and it turns out that when one of those animals gallops, their, their guts slam into the diaphragm with every stride, and so they can't pant while they run. And so if you chase an animal like that, it will overheat and die. When we lost our fur and started to sweat, it forced another turn in human evolution, the darkening of skin. What we had to do was compensate for the absence of hair. So early Homo sapiens were very darkly pigmented, and the dark melanin pigment helps to protect against very, very strong sunlight, especially ultraviolet radiation because increase in the amount of sun exposure and ultraviolet radiation causes damage to the DNA in the skin. And some of that damage, if it is unrepaired, can lead to skin cancer. Today, in the world's hottest regions, the inability of a body to produce the melanin that creates darker skin can be life-threatening. Some rare genetic mutations show just how vital skin color can be. If a mutation in certain human genes, the OCA genes, is handed down from both parents, then a child will be born with a condition called albinism. 
It's a genetic disorder and they are born without the melanin in the skin layers. And that melanin protects from the damage that ultraviolet rays can cause. And one must really take care of the ears here. Lesions. Ultraviolet damage to the DNA of the cells is the first stages which can then develop into a skin cancer. Sunscreen and even clothes may not be enough to keep these children safe. If our ancestors had not evolved to have darker skins, the harsh African sun would have become a real threat to survival. But early humans didn't just stay in Africa. Changes in their environment forced some to start moving north. Climate change may well have been a driver. It may have been that they were following animal herds that were migrating into those regions. I mean, basically, they were looking for their next meal and where it would come from. Darker pigmentation began to work against them. Outside of strong sunlight areas, dark pigmentation is not advantageous because it blocks too much ultraviolet radiation. And you need to be able to absorb some ultraviolet radiation in the skin to make vitamin D. And vitamin D production is essential for normal health and reproduction. And so the people underwent very strong natural selection to change pigmentation. As early modern humans moved to higher latitudes, they gradually evolved to have lighter skin. And when Homo sapiens arrived in Europe about 40,000 years ago, they encountered another group of humans, the Neanderthals. If we want to really understand what makes humans unique, we need to compare ourselves not only to the, our closest living relatives, the apes in Africa, but to our very closest relatives, the Neanderthals. Neanderthals had lived in caves across northern Europe for 200,000 years. They were well adapted to cold, but couldn't cope with erratic climate change. Archaeologists once believed the Neanderthals had become extinct more than 35,000 years ago. But with the mapping of the human genome, they're now able to disprove this. At the Max Planck Institute in Germany, Dr. Svante Perber scours ancient Neanderthal bones in search of their DNA. We are like archaeologists. We make an excavation, but not in an old cave or so, but in our genomes. It turns out that all people that today live outside Africa have a little bit of their DNA from Neanderthals. One or two percent of their DNA comes from Neanderthals, and that clearly came over by interbreeding, that there were babies that had one parent, a Neanderthal, and one a modern human. This interbreeding affects populations in different parts of the world today. Now, geneticists are trying to figure out what traits the Neanderthal DNA has given us. In Tibet, there is an adaptation to living at high altitude, where there is little oxygen in the air. And one knows what variant of which he confers a large part of that adaptation. And that variant turns out to come from Asian relatives of Neanderthals. Although many advantages were contained within Neanderthal DNA, they weren't enough to win out over the advanced abilities of Homo sapiens. Modern humans are special in their behavior, I think. They don't fully understand what aspect of the behavior, but somehow they are special. It's these special abilities that enabled Homo sapiens to rule the world.
Modern genetics is helping us understand how we got here. For example, when a mutation emerged in a region of the human genome known as AMY1, it triggered one of the biggest cultural shifts our species has ever known. AMY1 controls the enzyme salivary amylase, which enables us to start digesting starch in the mouth. Humans are a little bit unusual in that we have many copies of the salivary amylase gene, and so that equips us better to digest starch. You know, I think it's evolved in the last million years in connection with the use of fire, because the critical change in our diet that made it an advantage to have many copies of the salivary amylase gene is the point at which we started cooking starch-rich foods, particularly starch-rich tubers, because it makes it much, much more digestible. And our big brains sucked up this energy in the form of glucose. As we've evolved, our brains have got bigger. They've more than tripled in size. And that's going to place very, very heavy demands on our glucose needs. Now, we can meet that in different ways, but cooking starch-rich tubers would certainly be one good way of meeting those big glucose demands of having a great big brain. Until 12,000 years ago, our ancestors survived as hunter-gatherers who foraged for food. But as our genetic ability to digest starch spread, we could eat a wider variety of plants, which could be cooked and even grown as crops. It marked the beginning of agriculture. Among the first to exploit our ability to digest starch were the rice eaters of China. Here, more than 5,000 years ago, rice was cultivated in Eastern Asia for the first time. Today, it's still a cause for celebration. For the local Hani people, October marks their new year. And New Year's Day sees a rice festival of extraordinary proportions. For the Hani tribe, the new year is the period of harvest. Each house makes food, and then they gather and they greet the new year together. And sometimes there will be guests coming from far away. This is the Long Street Banquet, the highlight of the Hani New Year celebrations. More than 800 tables are laid out over a distance of one and a half kilometers. Across Asia, a diet based on rice has ensured centuries of healthy living. This Chinese grandmother holds an identity card which claims she was born on the 25th of June, 1886. I think I'm over 120 years old. I don't really remember properly, but uh, I'm getting on that way. <laughs> the rise of agriculture led directly to the growth of the human population. With agriculture, there's a lot more food available on one hectare of land than out in the forest. So agriculture permitted a population explosion. The reason that we have seven billion people in the world today is agriculture. 
The AMY1 mutation enabling starch digestion wasn't confined to Asia. It spread across the world. In parts of South America today, people still take full advantage of the human ability to digest starch in the mouth. In Santa Rosa, Peru, corn is the main staple. This woman is preparing a local speciality. She chews roasted corn powder, which is partially digested by the amylase in her saliva. She spits the corn back out and leaves it to ferment into a drink known as chicha. Chicha, it's alcohol made from corn. We like to give it to guests when they come to the house. Chicha has been enjoyed in the Americas since corn was first cultivated some 5,000 years ago. Since then, people the world over have turned to crop cultivation. But while agriculture ensured a regular food supply, it didn't necessarily guarantee a better diet. Traditional agriculture provided a much more uniform diet. So the first farmers were less healthy than the first hunter-gatherers. That's a paradox of farming. Farming did not always make people stronger. Sometimes invading armies could exploit this weakness. Many genetic mutations affect our ability to digest food. And some may have changed the course of history. In the early 13th century, the Jin dynasty of China had the strongest army in the world. In neighboring Mongolia, the forces of Genghis Khan were tiny in comparison. With an army ranking 10 times the size, the Chinese Jin should easily have obliterated an invading Mongolian force. Genghis Khan and his whole country probably had no more than 1 million people and about 100,000 soldiers. If you looked at China at that time, there were at least 1 million soldiers alone in China. Despite their lack of numbers, the Mongol armies of Genghis Khan had a secret weapon hidden in their DNA. Many people in Mongolia are lactase persistent, so they, they are able to drink lots of milk, which is incredibly nutrient dense. Not all adult humans are able to digest milk. Many Mongolians had a genetic mutation which meant they were able to digest sugar from milk into adulthood. Evolutionary biologists like Mark Thomas study our genetic past to find out more about this mutation. The one thing we do know is that it's been under very, very strong natural selection. It's given our ancestors or ancestors who had that trait a big advantage. I mean, a really big advantage. It's one of the strongest signatures of natural selection of any single gene trait in our genomes. The milk drinking mutation was common among Mongolians, but not among the Chinese Jin. With the Jin, people were all using primarily carbohydrates. The problem with the carbohydrates in the short term is that the energy is depleted very quickly. They give you a lot of energy and then it's gone. But Genghis Khan's warriors revived themselves with horse's milk and cheese. This made them leaner, fitter fighters with a physique built on strong, calcium-rich bones. And the Mongol soldiers didn't just benefit individually. The ability to digest milk affected their whole military strategy. The Chinese 
Chinese armies, they often had to have as many animals pulling food as carrying people. So the soldiers often had to walk into battle because the animals were being used to pull carts and to transport food in very large amounts. The Mongols, there was none of that. Every soldier was riding his horse, and he had several other horses with him. And these horses served not only as a transportation, but also the food. The Mongolians milked the mares they rode and drank frequently. This gave the Mongols a great advantage. They may have only had 100,000 soldiers, but every soldier was a warrior. Not only did the Mongol army make full use of every soldier, it could also travel fast. So this was very important strategically in the movement of the Mongols. It gave them the ability to strike anywhere in the Chinese empire. The Jin dynasty officials never knew which city would the Mongols hit next, because the Mongols could travel just as fast as the news could travel. The Mongol diet proved very advantageous for them in their battle against the Jin. The Mongols had a great advantage, and they were able to use this in a strategic way in their fight against the sedentary people who depended on agricultural products. Milk became the food of conquerors. The milk digesting mutation spread fast. Legend has it Genghis Khan had many wives and hundreds of children. The Mongol Empire was one of the greatest eras of cultural growth and also of physical and biological development in the history of the world. But it came at a cost. As the victorious milk-drinking Mongols swept towards Europe, they brought death and destruction in more ways than one. The animals traveling with them carried virulent pathogens. Since the dawn of agriculture, many people now lived in densely populated towns and villages. Disease could easily spread. Keeping livestock had given protein to our diet, but it also brought disease. Where sedentary populations live in close proximity to animals, new diseases have the perfect opportunity to emerge. Animal domestication had two consequences for diseases. First of all, it gave us the germs that evolved into human epidemic diseases. And secondly, it permitted the dense populations necessary for maintaining an epidemic disease. In the early 14th century, a deadly epidemic emerged in Yunnan, China. It became known as the plague. Plague is also known as Black Death because people's bodies would develop black blisters. The plague traveled all the way across Eurasia, hitching a ride with the invading Mongol armies. At the Museum of London, curator of human osteology Jelena Beckvillitz studies the skeletons of plague victims in search of evidence of the world's worst pandemic. This is a male and he's very complete. We look to see as many possible changes that we can in the skeleton which might indicate disease or stress or malnutrition. We'll also look at the teeth because the teeth will tell us things about diet. The Black Death reached England in 1348. Here, 
people believed the deadly disease was carried by birds. Plague doctors wore a bird mask in the hope of protection. But nothing could protect the people of England from invasion by this new disease. In all, the Black Death wiped out a third of the European population. Beckfellitz's studies help explain why. The thing with the Black Death as, as a disease is that we had never been exposed to that bacteria before. So it had a huge impact on us. It was survival of the fittest in action. Any vulnerability spelt death from the highly infectious and fast acting disease. The symptoms can come on very quickly. You might be dead within a day. But the populations that survived came out stronger. Each time we're affected by diseases, then our immune response potentially gets better. So potentially each generation will have a better resistance. The Black Death had a significant impact on European history. But elsewhere, the cost of an invading disease on a vulnerable population was much higher. More than 60 miles off the coast of Africa sit the Canary Islands. One of the smallest in the archipelago is the rocky outcrop of La Gomera. Here, a population of 24,000 hides an intriguing genetic past. The first clue to their ancestry lies in their unusual form of communication. The whistling language probably survived on La Gomera because for centuries the island population was cut off from the rest of the world. This isolation came at a cost. The founders of the indigenous Canary populations, they would have started off with a decent amount of genetic variation. But if the populations are small for a long time, then there's an effect known as genetic drift which reduces genetic diversity. It's thought this lack of genetic diversity spelt the end for La Gomera's founding fathers. Known as the Guanches, this warrior race is today commemorated by these statues. To work out what happened, researchers first need to know where the Guanches came from. The Guanches mummified their dead. So when technology advanced and enabled scientists to extract ancient DNA from Guanches remains, it finally gave the researchers a window on the past. We carried out DNA studies based on both teeth and bones. And what they prove is that effectively they have very similar genetic markers to those that are or were in that period in North Africa. Scientists are now sure that the Guanches are related to the Berbers of the North African Maghreb. A modern-day local tradition seems to support this. Lucha Canaria, or Canarian wrestling, is thought to have originated in North Africa. It was brought to the island by the Guanches and takes advantage of the typical Guanche physique, tall and bulky. We are Canarian, and we are the descendants of Guanches. And I am very proud of our tradition. But how come these hardy warriors disappeared in the 15th century? 
1496, the conquest of the islands was complete. And it ends because the previous winter there was a terrible epidemic. It was called the sleeping sickness of the Guanches. And the chronicles of the conquest indicate, among other things, that it was a miracle that no Spanish person was affected, but the Guanches died by the thousands. And so that's what makes us think that it was a disease that the Spanish were already exposed to. So their immune systems were ready to fight it, but the Guanches were not. Like the victims of the Black Death, the Guanches were vulnerable to disease brought from elsewhere. Some of the genes that are involved in immunity, we really want them to be as diverse as possible because that allows us to actually be resistant to a greater number of diseases. And so in the Canary Islands, the populations were relatively small and isolated for a long time and so became genetically vulnerable to disease. The conquistadors used the Canary Islands as a stepping stone to the Americas and like the Mongols, the diseases they brought with them laid waste to a vulnerable local population. The full horror had only just begun. When the Europeans colonized America, the diseases they brought with them had bitter consequences. Something like 90% of Native Americans were killed by European-introduced diseases to which Native Americans had no resistance, whereas Europeans had some resistance. Smallpox, measles, tuberculosis killed far more Native Americans than did those big battles like the Little Bighorn. It would be several centuries before the great pioneers of modern medicine found ways to combat disease successfully. Throughout the 20th century, medical advances continued to increase our chances of survival. And with the turn of the new millennium, molecular genetics changed the story of our evolution yet again. In part two of the evolution of us, where are we going? How will our understanding of genetics control evolution and shape the future of humankind?